Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Bold Conjectures with Paris Chopra. Today I'm with uh, Petri Friedman, who is a general partner at Pronomos Capital, uh, the world's first charter city VC fund. Before this, he founded the Sea Steading Institute, a non-profit that explores creation of sovereign ocean colonies. So what is a charter city? What does a sovereign ocean colony mean? We'll explore all these ideas uh, in detail with Patrick pretty soon. For now, you should know that uh, Patrick is a champion for innovation in governance. Uh, our economy thrives because there's a continuous innovation happening when new products and services are brought in the market. Uh, that innovation is mostly driven by startup companies who challenge stat- status quo of established companies. But uh, this dynamic doesn't exist in governance. Uh, we're stuck with the legal systems and constitutions we are born into. So uh, what if we could kickstart a new city or an entire, or even a country to take an entirely sort of new look at society? That's the topic of today's discussion. Uh, welcome, Petri. Hey, thanks for having me. So I'd like to begin with uh, really tracing out the trajectory of your career. Uh, and, you know, that sort of uh, brings me to Seasteading uh, Institute. So really, what led you to starting Seasteading Institute? I believe you were at Google back then. So uh, yeah, I would love to sort of get into as much history of your personal uh, uh, personal sort of um, or professional life, how it's traced out. Yeah, I mean, it's it, in some ways, it's the typical story of somebody who wants something that doesn't exist and is frustrated with that and then works to create it. It's just that the insane thing that I wanted that didn't exist is like a country that aligns with my values that like is run confidently. Um, so it actually, it was actually even uh, before Google, I got an interest in this stuff. It was after college. I graduated in 98 with a degree in math. I moved to the Bay Area and went to Stanford and studied computer science for a few years. I dropped out once a year working on AI for online poker. I think I probably had the first like break even uh, online poker bot, but then the U.S. made it illegal, and we, we weren't ready to move out of the country. Um, and then, and I was really like, just I was in a place where I could choose where I lived, and I was like, well, is this the country that I should live in? Like, it really it doesn't match my values. They fund wars, um, and I don't feel like I get great value for my taxes. And I looked at other countries, and I found, well, it's they're different packages, but there's not like another country where it's like, oh yeah, that's the one. Um, there's some better in some things, some in others. And I, I got curious. I was like, you know, wait, like why? Um, and one reason is that I'm a libertarian. And so I would want to live in a country that uh, followed those values of, of respecting human freedom and, and, and not using violence. Um, and we're a minority in the U.S. and the world. It just seems to be like maybe genetic, but maybe libertarians are five or 10 or 20 percent, but not more than that. And so you know, in scattered in a democracy, they're not going to do very well. And I just got really curious to dig into like, why isn't there a country for me? I started reading a lot of politics and economics and just exploring this idea. Uh, and I came to this realization that if you look at government as an industry, if we throw away all the like morality and philosophy, and we just say, hey, we got these countries, they're like firms, I'm a dissatisfied customer. What's the structure of the industry? And the structure is it's super, super hard to enter, like a crazy barrier to entry. Like the barrier to entry is you have to like take over a country and like have it be able to like write a new constitution, right? Or like new, uh, like sweeping laws. Because even if you get elected as president, that doesn't like actually do something new um, or somehow start a new country. And then the costs of switching are really high. It's hard for people to switch countries. Um, you know, you, you're, you're moving, especially in those days, this is 20 years ago, there was a lot less remote work. You're moving your family, you know, your social networks, your job. It's it's difficult. And there's other characteristics that are like that where it's just not a competitive industry. So there's not startups. So of course there's not innovation. Um, and then going based on this idea, I said, well, you know, what what could we do to improve this? Well, we have to be able to start new countries. Small teams of people need to be able to have a blank slate and make something better. And governments in the early 2000s were not at all willing to do kind of experiments. And so I looked at the ocean as the next frontier and that led me to seasteading. And so I, I wrote a book. Um, yeah, I'm a programmer. So I wrote this this book about seasteading. I looked at all how you can do it. Where do you get your water, your energy? Um, what's the design? And I made it so that you could click on any paragraph and leave comments. And so I would update the book. Um, the book was like even 
it was written in Markdown and then compiled to a book. So this by was like this was way before Google Docs. I'm imagining. That's right. Yeah. This was this was 2002, three. Okay. <laughs> um, and I had the idea for ephemeral, like, oh, if we're gonna go try to live on the ocean, we're gonna go try to live under new systems of government permanently. Maybe we should try it out for a week first and get together and have a floating festival. So it was that, and then I got a job at Google. I got connected to Peter Thiel, and he funded me. And finally, you know, after researching this stuff, starting in 2000, 2001, in 2007, I was able to get funding to leave Google and launch the C7 Institute in 2008. So that was the beginning. Right, right. So uh, what's the current status of the project? Uh... Yeah, so C setting is really hard. The ocean is expensive. And we finally, after all these years, uh, there's a project, there's a group of people in Panama called Ocean Builders who are manufacturing sea uh, pods, which are a, a sing, single spar, meaning there's one tall pillar, there's flotation under the water, there's a house on top of the pillar, but it has very little water line area. And it's single family home size. They're manufacturing them in Panama. The first one actually rolled up the assembly line yesterday and they're they're taking orders. They they cost a few hundred thousand. So it's gotten there. Um, and we've had some discussions with countries to do offshore free trade zones and anchor seasteads offshore uh, and built a big community around it. But it's, it's really difficult. Uh, and I think that the number of economically practical ways to do seasteading is, is pretty small. And from the political innovation standpoint, there's a lot of reasons to live on the ocean. It's, it's you know, it's beautiful. There's uh, resources like ocean thermoelectric conversion for energy and aquaculture um, that, that can be farmed. And a lot of ecological and blue technology reasons to go there. But from the innovative governance perspective, things have changed and countries on land are now willing to kind of fragment their legal systems and give a lot more autonomy to special economic zones. And so my focus now is on doing these projects on land. Got it. So before we get into that, I'm curious, uh, what's the legal status of just putting like a house in the middle of nowhere, theoretically? Is it like a country of its own or? No, no it is 0.0000% a country of its own. All land is claimed and countries, you know, it's, you can think of it a little bit like the way a country would like would defend its intellectual property. If somebody's like like violating its intellectual property, if you let that person get away with it, that weakens your claim, that threatens your entire existing business. Yeah. And so they're very aggressive about no, it. No, I, I meant ocean. If you Oh, on the ocean. Okay. The ocean is really it's it's a really interesting legal environment. So um first, anything that's fixed in place and doesn't move basically doesn't have anything special legally. So it's governed by the nearest coastal state. And okay. there is there is if it's if it's outside the 200 nautical mile limit for the economic zone, it's like kind of un, like it hasn't been tested because nobody's been able to do it. But in okay. principle, it would just be the closest country. Got so it. that's not interesting. What's super interesting is ships because they move around all the time. It's It's impractical to govern them that way. So there's what's called admiralty law. And what it says is that a ship registers with a country it flies the flag of that country and when that ship is out on the high seas it's under the law of that country in fact not just when it's out um when a ship is is in port for example like the labor laws the immigration laws of that country if if the workers don't get off the boat it's still the flag country right they, they still have it's still to some degree that territory and it's really cool because the kind of if I think about the kind of dynamic and innovative legal system I'd want to design, the idea that a bit of territory could have an annual registration with like who it gets its sovereignty from, and then that country kind of has specific rules that they apply, and they say like how much of the laws you get to do for yourself and what your limitations are, like that's what we'd want. And it yeah. actually already exists on the ocean. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult economically to kind of to fund things out there. But yeah, it's this virtual association, which is which is really neat. Now, when you're in past 12 miles, you are mostly governed by the laws of the coastal state. And when you're between 12 and 200 miles, the economic zone, the coastal state governs all 
So all like resource-based economic activity. So any kind of like fishing, oil and mineral, um, scientific research of the ocean around that may generate profit. Some, I mean, some people think even like capturing solar energy above your structure might be regulated, but any in, purely internal ec economic right. activity on the ship yeah. is reg regulated by the, by the flagging state. Okay. So, uh, but still it has to be registered to a country. You can't just make up your own flag and say this no way. if if you're not registered to a country then any country's warship is allowed to board you and seize you and do whatever they want okay you have no rights this is in international law only countries have rights and this is like the harsh truth um and pe people are, and and if you like are are like not plugged in if you're not registered with a sovereign whether on land or on the ocean like you are you're nothing and mm. another misconception people have is that sovereignty is somehow like transferable with land like they think that if a country says this land is not ours and and you come and claim it that you're somehow a sovereign you're only a sovereign if the if the countries of the world recognize you as a sovereign it has nothing to do with whether you have a bit of land right. and a country's not able to like declare you a sovereign it's something that's done by the whole international right community. so it's not as much self-declaration but more recognition by peers essentially that's right. So my focus is very much on working with existing countries to plug in through their sovereignty, the way you do an admiralty law or with a charter city, and to get some of the legal stack to be local, to have to have autonomy over some part of the law, some part of the courts, so that we can show that by doing that, we can innovate and make great cities for people to live in and bring economic growth and create jobs for people in a country and uplift the region and all of that. Right. So essentially, um, decoupling law into a stack and only inheriting like a minimum, minimum viable law, but rest of it is something uh, you would sort of build for that special circumstance that you're sort of trying to solve. But I'm curious, uh, what what is leading to this kind of change? Why are governments okay to let different sort of uh, maybe, you know, say different projects or different ships have their own laws beyond whatever laws they have at their land yeah, that's it's a really interesting question i mean it's, it's be fun to explore with you like i i'm not sure one like very broad way of thinking about it is that 21st century ways of doing things are really different than 20th century ways of doing things they involve more uncoupling breaking things into smaller pieces more flexibility recognizing the benefits of decentralization and being small and if you apply those trends to countries, you have small countries realizing um, that they may have like there's having a small economy has like a diseconomy of scale. Like there, it you function worse when you're small. You don't have as much specialization. But governance seems to have some really big like diseconomies of scale where the larger it is, the worse it works. And so small countries are able to be more innovative to try like more bold new things. There's there's fewer people that you have to convince. And so they're, they're using this in a variety of ways to do new things. Uh, and that, I think that's something that helps. There's an idea that maybe crypto showing that that, um, you know, a, a community of people can take back sovereignty over their currency, something traditionally done by the nation state in a really serious way. You have to, if you're a country, you have to kind of pause and reconsider like what this means about what the 21st century is going to look like. Like these various functions of government, some of them are going to be are, are going to be broken up and done in these different ways. Um, right. Yeah. You know, I, and mm. there's the the people putting the ideas out there and advocating for them. Um, you know, people people like me or Mark Flutter of the Charter Cities Institute, Paul Romer with his Charter Cities idea, although he's not doing anything with it now, but he put it out there just kind of growing acceptance that this might be a good thing to do. Hmm. I think the historical case studies also that have proven, I mean, given a lot of data, uh, like Singapore comes into the mind, such a small country. Singapore, but, DIFC, and like the whole Hong Kong Shenzhen thing, right? The dream for, for from my perspective for a charter city is that you do, you do it in one, right? The goal is to uplift humanity. And if, the hope is that a charter city can be really effectively run, bring in lots of foreign investments, have companies that grow, create jobs for the locals, and kind of be this shining economic light for the region. 
and that this diffuses out into the rest of the rest of the country or the rest of the region and leads to huge economic growth in the area. And like this is maybe a realistic dream because it actually happened. Right. right and lifted right. more people out of poverty than has ever happened before in the world. So maybe we can repeat that. Yeah. Or there's Dubai International Financial Center, um, you know, which did this 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 they were this innovator in decoupling where they said, we want to make a financial center. And our kind of old Sharia-based law is not great for regulating that. Let's view the law as like the tech stack we build our product on. Like you would want to use the right programming language, database, server, web environment for, for a software app. They're like, what's the right legal stack? It's not our law. And they decided that London was the leader. And they went and copied and modified London financial regulations and corporate law, commercial law in English. And they said, in this area, we're going to use this commercial law. And not just in this area, but any corporations that are incorporated here will operate under that law uh, wherever they are in, in, in the UAE. And so that was this huge innovation where, they, where in this zone, you follow, have to follow, of course, like the, the constitution, the high level of the UAE, and then the Emirate of Dubai. Criminal law and all that is the same, but all of this commercial law is different. Right. And and it worked. It worked great. And that's the standard we're going for um, in, in most of these charter cities. That's what the, the Hunter and Zeta program had, for example, right. and what we're talking yeah. to other Yeah. So before about. we get into that, since uh, I think you've used the term charter cities, I think it'd be wonderful to have maybe a definition of it. Yeah. So to me, a, a charter city is a region that has different, it's a type of special jurisdiction that has different laws and institutions from the rest of the country. It's the evolution of the special economic zone, but where an SEZ tends to have shallow reforms, like some different like tax breaks or tariff breaks, a uh, charter city is much deeper reform where some significant part of the legal stack is actually different. And DIFC is kind of the, you know, the example of that. And what I'm looking to do at, at, at Pronomos, um, DIFC was, was designed and funded and operated by the government. And as a venture capitalist, I'm interested in the same thing, but through public-private partnerships, where a company works together with the government to to operate the jurisdiction. Got it. So it's uh, so charter city is like a region in a country with fundamentally different laws. It may share the basics, the the very base level criminal law, but everything else sort of imported from say the best of the world, like from London or somewhere else, maybe. Uh, Maybe even currency could be different, right? I have not seen currency being different in any of the charter cities so far, but nothing stops for even doing that, right? Yeah, I think in, in Honduras Prospera, they're they're um, you know they have regulations to accept Bitcoin. That's an example, and they 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 do have authority over currency. I mean, you can view it as a slider, right? With like like how much of the legal stack is different? There's just like a slider, like where zero is like you're just a normal territory in the country. And as you slide all the way up, you know, you might call it like 50 or 60 or 70 percent to have kind of all commercial law. And then 100 percent, you're actually like effectively a sovereign. And we could argue about what point makes it a charter city. But we're just saying that special economic zone is down there at like 5 percent. Right. Yeah. And we're looking at things that are more like 50 percent. Right. This is super interesting. I think uh, it sort of also uh, lets you get away from the idea of sovereignty being binary. But instead, it could be viewed as a continuum. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, getting full sovereignty is a much more difficult task versus, uh, and it might not even be required for the whole goal of uplifting humanity, right? You don't need to really, I mean, it's not an ego thing that you need to start a new country. Rather, it's probably getting to like a set of systems, which can uh, work much That's more right. effectively than current systems. So I'm curious, Petri, I mean, you must be talking to many or you must have been studying many different uh, government and systems, government. So in your, uh, from your perspective, in what types of governments you felt are more flexible for something like this? Because this is a radical break from how history has happened. So yeah, who's, who's more open to this idea and who do you feel is closed and who has an advantage, say, in the next 20, 30 years uh, for, you know, sort of this to be the sort of the early mover and attract because they can be just... Uh, I mean, there's network effects in charter cities also, right? Just like products. So being an early mover is quite important. Yeah, I mean, I'll give 
I'll give the interesting answer and the boring answer. I mean, the interesting answer is that there's kind of like philosophically, there's two types of governments that seem the most receptive or that kind of get it. And this is a, you know, two really weird ones. It's autocracies and sort of like decentralized, like localist democracies. So from the like autocracy standpoint, um, they are able to just kind of make decisions and look at like what's most efficient and most effective. And it's, you know, a bit more like talking to a CEO, um, you know, rather than talking to some giant system of, of unions and parties. And then countries that have more where just the way that they operate is with much more local power, they get the idea because this is about kind of taking some part of the legal stack that's on the entire country and saying, okay, this part of it, we give the power to set it to the locality. Um, and so places like that get it. That's and, and that's kind of weird. But in terms of who's kind of wanting and hungry for this, it's really just countries that want economic development and that have seen that kind of other more traditional routes of development aren't working very well. And they're like, oh, okay, this is, you know, we know that special economic zones, I mean, they don't always work, but it's, it's this great policy tool that sometimes is able to bring a lot of economic growth to a region. And this is the next evolution of that. Maybe it's worth trying. So that's kind of the bread and butter is, is countries that just, they want foreign direct investment. They want jobs for their people. They want to, you know, grow their GDP. Great. Uh, hmm. Do you sense they might be, I mean, some sense of uh, maybe uh, the sense of giving up control? I mean, I, I know like a country, I mean, especially with autocracies, wherein if you sort of carve out something, I mean, do you, do you sense that like, uh, because it's sort of like the, on that continuum going towards sovereignty? So are some governments you feel are just too sort of fearful? Yeah, definitely. Um you know, there has to be some kind of willingness to share and governments, some governments are, are very fearful about it. Um, in, in Honduras, for example, the first version of, of the program that was passed in, I think about 2010, uh, it was struck down by the Supreme Court. So I was working with, so the story in Honduras is that, um, so could you maybe, uh, maybe give a little bit of background about this project? Yeah. So Honduras had a constitutional crisis in 2009, and the conservative party that 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 took over after that and, and won in, in the elections, um, several of them were Western trained, uh, economically literate, and uh, especially this guy, Octavio Sanchez, they brought this idea of this advanced special economic zone modeled on DIFC, where there was uh, the right for the zone to have very different commercial law. And they created a program, they changed the constitution in Honduras uh, in, in 2010 and 2011, the first program of its kind in the world. I started working with them in 2011. I actually had the first MOU to operate one of these zones, kind of the first modern charter city company. Um, Paul Romer was involved. He'd done his charter city's TED talk a, a few years earlier, and he had this, this vision um, Romer's vision, it, which kind of hasn't panned out, is for um, a ho the, the host country to have a city that's actually operated by um, a, a really effective country, a developed country like Canada. Um, his idea is that investors and businesses would trust uh, because it was run by Canada. Of course, in practice, um, such countries don't want to run cities in other countries. And countries are very, very leery about letting some large country yeah. run a city there. So there's, it's basically completely dead on the spot. But he, he had a lot of great ideas about, um, you know, the economics of, of charter cities and growth. And then in 2012, their Supreme Court struck down the program, partly because the degree of autonomy that was being granted outside of the Honduran democracy was too much, and the program was modified and passed a bit a bit weaker. So that was an example of that of that fear, um, you know. And it's it's a really it's really hard to do something that has never been done before in the world, and it just took Honduras a lot of years to get this program operating. And so, you know, my my company we realized that it, it wasn't going to happen anytime soon. So we actually wound up operations in 2012. And I don't think they they approved the first zone until the late 2010s, maybe 2017, 18, 19, with various various okay. partial approvals. Okay. 
So, um, so the idea is, I mean, just like Dubai is operated by the government in UAE, the, uh, these charter cities like the one you're talking about will be operated by a private company, which is, which is like so fascinating. So uh, as, um, as someone who invests in this, um, uh, I'm curious, like, have you made any investments? What sort of proposals have you heard? Uh, what are some of the exciting things that are happening in this space? Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we've made um, six investments and we're looking at, at several more. Um, so we invested in Honduras Prospera, which is kind of the first, um, you know, modern special economic, private special economic zone uh, in this new model. We've invested in a company called Praxis. Praxis is doing something really interesting where they're starting, they have this idea of demand aggregation rather than going and working with a country to pass legislation and get land and then looking for people to bring to it. They've created a, uh, a community of ambitious young entrepreneurs uh, who want to make a better world, who are kind of positive optimists. And they've got, um, you know, thousands and thousands of them. And this community all intends to, to live together in a city. Okay. And many of them gather in co-housing houses in major cities uh, across, across the U.S. and maybe internationally. Uh, and so they get a chance to live together and get to know each other and form community. And meanwhile, the company is in, in negotiation with various countries to find a location for the city. And with this demand first approach, Praxis gets to say, Hey, we're going to bring, you know, a thousand or five thousand of these ambitious young entrepreneurs and their startups and the companies they're going to create. And that's incredibly beneficial for the local economy. So that gives them something to bring to the table in order to get a, a really good deal for a charter city. So that's exciting. Um, another one of our, of our companies is talent cities in Nigeria. Talent cities is, is looking to repatriate Nigerian tech workers by creating a city that has uh, more effective laws and reliable infrastructure. There's nowhere right now in Nigeria where you can put a thousand tech workers with the infrastructure so that they can live and work and do their jobs. Um, and it's led by a wonderful entrepreneur, E, who's had uh, two African unicorns. Another one is Small Farms Africa. So this is small high-tech farming villages in Malawi. Um, that's the the founder john has, has been in africa for decades and he's like a systems thinker who's thinking about how you change the governance systems the laws the food systems um the community and how people would live together all of these different overlapping circles and, and and starting small uh so those are just those are some of them projects that i'm really excited about right now um i'm going to africa for the first time uh probably in late october to look uh, at our companies there as well as to go and visit a few countries that are really interested in working with us. I see this incredible potential for Africa. Uh, you know, it's urbanizing rapidly. It's just really kind of underdeveloped compared to its potential. And it's just, it's just going to be, you know, the, the place to be for this kind of thing for, for a while to come. Excited there. And then I also, I just got back from a trip to Asia. Uh, I went to, um, to Singapore and Indonesia and saw some really fascinating projects in Indonesia where people are building kind of lifestyle villages that have their own health and wellness and, and schools. Um, and just really this idea of kind of communities reclaiming sovereignty is the theme that, I, that, that I'm seeing and that we're mm. kind of looking to invest in beyond just charter cities. So we started out with this charter cities focus, and that's still the core of what we do. But more broadly, it's groups of people who say there's some big system in the outside world that we have to like have in our lives that works like crap. You know, we want to do it better. We want to own it and control it. And whether that's commercial law, whether it's the, the medical system, the educational system, how we live together, living together more in community and not atomized, the currency, like in, in crypto, something big that people, that a community of people is taking back. We're just right. seeing more and more of that. Yeah. So one of the themes across all these projects is a group of people coming together. Um, and actually, in the second case, you were talking about even willing to relocate anywhere in the world where they get a good deal. Um, I'm very curious. I mean, I've always thought it's hard to convince, uh, say, more than maybe like a handful of people to do something together. But it seems like uh, on the order of thousands of people, 
are just willing to get together. So uh, what dynamics are you seeing? How are these incredibly smart, talented, motivated people are getting to a consensus to do something, uh, you know, do something together because getting to a consensus is always one of the most difficult things as a group becomes larger. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, there's something I've seen, for example, with intentional communities in, in, in my friends group in the Bay Area where people want to live together in community, but, um, you know, getting a group of people to organize on, you know, 10 families, 20 families and all moving somewhere together is 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 really hard. And then with, with how difficult building is in California with all of the uh, difficult permitting and zoning laws to get, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 fam families to like spend years advancing a project to build something it's it's really hard to hold it together um and so it, it you know it is it is difficult but i think in in the when it's something as as exciting as like building a city of the future together i think that you can get thousands of people and then i think what people miss is that early especially with seasteading when you're looking at being out you know outside of the exclusive economic zones you know hundreds of miles from land uh, in something independent, then everybody there had to move there from far away. And I think you can get some number of people, but that's really difficult. But the thing about about doing sovereign communities on land is that you're you're drawing from the locality in the region. So you may have some number of of say founders or higher net worth individuals who are coming or bringing the capital, helping get the project started, starting companies and creating jobs. But most people who live there are going to be people from the region. And, you know, this is it. First off, it kind of solves this problem of like city residents because people aren't moving so far. And then from a human interest standpoint, like it's incredibly important because this is how we uplift the region. We create places that give jobs for the locals, not just foreign transplants. Like it's a, it's a partnership between the people coming in and starting the companies and then the local people who are, who are coming and like learning that culture, learning that entrepreneurial culture, like working at the companies and learning how to start their own countries. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, like the, the migration crisis, right, it's, it's like awful for both sides. There's countries that are, that are, you know, saying there's all the people who want to live here. Um, you know, it's more than we can acculturate. We don't want to take them in. And then these other people, they're having to leave their homes, <laughs> leave their family and their homeland for economic opportunity. That's terrible. And if we can develop economic opportunity in the countries so that the people who would leave and uh, try to go someplace else for a better job can stay and work in the country, like, that's amazing. Right. Yeah. So as a VC, uh, what stage do you invest in? Uh, I mean, these pro some of these projects, frankly, sound like very capital intensive. So I'm very curious, what does say something like a seed investment or very early stage investment for a charter city or a community even mean? I mean, obviously building, I mean, like uh, building uh, all the physical infrastructure is just very, very high capital intensive. And I'm not sure if that's what you're underwriting as a VC. That's right. I mean, because because we're new and small, especially in Fund One. Fund One's about thirteen million. We're very early stage, kind of hands on with founding teams from early on, pre seed and seed, and then we'll we'll sometimes do some. So our, our smallest check that we've written is a hundred thousand, and our biggest is a million. Uh, that million was lead it was leading a Series A round, um, but but we were a my a minority of the round by dollars, but it was kind of high net worth, like super angels, not fund. And so we did all the negotiation and set the terms. Um, you know, a pre-seed check might be 100,000, 250,000, you know, seed check, you know, 250, 500 generally. And yeah, we're, we're funding these earlier concept development stages when you're uh, working to pass legislation, um, finding your potential tenants, like identifying the target industries, maybe getting options on the land. Now, in some countries, remember, like in some of these countries, land is much less expensive. So, for example, in Africa, there, there are projects that are, are with those kinds of checks with, you know, say small millions in financing are able to get some initial plot of land. But you're right that as you get more land and certainly as you develop it, uh, it gets really expensive. And so we work with with capital partners, with kind of later stage co-investors and help our companies raise or, you know, or, or, or try to. and then. We at Pronomos, we're kind of moving up that stack as the industry matures and grows, right? So these sovereign communities, it's really, it's really new. So a lot of them are quite small, so it works out all right. But 
um, you know, in, in our next fund, it's going to be quite a bit larger and we'll be able to do kind of series A and, and, and series B checks. And we're just like looking to grow as the sector grows. Um, you know, it's, I think that our third fund is probably going to be some, a private equity fund. That's not, you know, it's not like VC operational equity, but is doing debt and more traditional project Mm. financing. Got it. So if, uh, for any entrepreneurs who are listening to this, uh, uh, who sort of are interested or who are working in a similar space, I'm not sure if they may even recognize what they're doing is uh, a charter city or intentional community, but I keep coming across entrepreneurs who are trying to do something on the physical front, you know, getting people together. So are there any specific areas or regions, uh, both focus areas and geographical regions you're interested in that they can reach out to you with uh, their pitches and also sort of uh, what sort of background do you really look at from a founder perspective, because this is just so new. Right. Uh, so yeah, in terms of focus areas, so we're interested in in sovereign communities, communities that are taking some significant part of the stack of systems that we live under and doing it themselves in some in some new and better way. Um, you know, I'm I'm most pa- our kind of our core is doing that for governance, but we're we're now looking at kind of other kinds of sovereign communities as well. Uh, in terms of geographic regions, um, we won't. Uh, the only project that we've passed because of the strictly because of the country was in Russia uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we don't work in the EU because under the strictures of the EU, you just there's just you you can't really redesign that many of the systems. I mean, I'm open to being convinced by a project, but we basically don't see much governance potential there. Otherwise, um, you know, Latin America, Africa, Asia. Uh, you know, basically the whole developing world has a lot of potential um, and, you know, developed world. It, it's interesting. So most of the most of the the demand is for economic growth um, and it's from the developing world. But there's some interest from the developed world from a, a regulatory sandbox perspective or wanting to kind of it's not that they uh, that they need more foreign investment and more jobs, but that they're interested in having kind of a, a, a test test area where they can try out new rules and regulations. So, you know, we're, we're, we're open to that. Um, in terms of founder background, you know, really like, like the vast majority of it is a founder is a founder, right? And all of the attributes that like any Silicon Valley VC looks like. And then what's, what's additional here is uh, strong ties to the country or region you're operating in. Um, that's, you know, it's this, this stuff is so, so local. So that's really important. I mean, for example, we're going to start doing, uh, conferences, getting together founders and government officials and investors and advisors over the next year. And it's going to be like, we can't do like a a global conference would almost be pointless. You know, we're going to do, we're going to do one in Asia. We're going to do one in Africa. We're going to do one in, uh, in the Caribbean, um, you know, because it's so local. And then I think, you know, because this is community building, uh, something that's different from some, you know, some other founder roles is looking for some experience doing that. I mean, mm-hmm. for it, for me, it's it, it's fun. So I, I came out of college and, you know, in addition to thinking about new countries, I was also like, I really don't like living in an apartment far from my friends. And so in 2000, uh, three friends and I got a group house together uh, in, in Sunnyvale, the Alpine Butterfly Lodge, and we lived together, we hosted parties. And, um, you know, we found like more and more of our friends were like, Oh, this is good. Let's do that. So we were part of this kind of like early wave of group houses in the Bay Area. And then in 2005, um, you know, with a, with a different group of friends, I got um, 16 two bedroom apartments. So it was okay. these this little apartment complex, and we had a community there. Uh, so I and I, I've kind of always been interested in building and living in community. And I just got to kind of re add that to my resume as an investor, as we're expanding from just charter cities to sovereign communities, like, oh, I mean, I'm a community founder and that was something that just hadn't been relevant before. So it's relevant for the for the founders as well. Right, got it. So Petra, I want you to sort of switch gears and talk about a little, a uh, few other threads. One of them is uh, really, uh, I mean, thinking deeply about economics, you know, runs in your family, uh, both uh, your grandfather, Milton Friedman and your father, David Friedman have been influential economists. So I'm curious, how did their thinking shape your thinking? And also, 
do you recognize now uh, in what way your ideas differ from your their ideas and this may be a really broad question but feel free to sort of uh, i'm just very curious of the influence both uh, where you agree with them and disagree with them yeah i mean i think you know i think all of us share the same values of of freedom and the belief that economics is the tool that you use to analyze how human beings work together and what works and doesn't work uh and that there's differences between what we want in a society but there i think i think they're small like the biggest differences between us are just what age we we grew up and worked in like they're just like three different intellectual environments and that's kind of what 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 shaped our work so um you know my my grandfather uh his work was you know i would say it was mostly like kind of like advocating for more economically efficient solutions advocating for better policies trying to teach people about the benefits of freedom you know as well as all of his technical economic research you know, that was his, his, his sort of from a political perspective and you know he's had he's had incredible success right if you look at ideas like um like income share agreements to fund education the you know ending the drafts and having the volunteer army uh the earned income tax credit being like a negative income tax he said incredible policy success but but the he he still didn't change the overall trajectory of kind of our government um getting older and working worse and worse and special interests accumulating and all of those kind of democratic dynamics and you know it makes sense he he came he came of age before we had public choice so public choice for those who don't know is this uh multiple nobel prize winning area of economics that that analyzes rationally kind of how democracies and other political systems work and what types of laws they produce and we unfortunately have really compelling evidence that democracies tend to produce laws that favor special interests at the uh you know and and at the expense of the individual which is not what you'd expect with voting but you know it it it's it uh it can, ends up Can you give an of example stuff. of that? Yeah so so the, the you know the the simple example that shows the dynamics is is it's about information and coordination costs so suppose there's a law that will cost every american a dollar 350 million americans cost 350 million dollars but it's going to benefit some company by 50 million dollars that law if you just look across the entire country 50 million benefit 350 million cost minus 300 million laws like that will pass every time because there's no way for all of us voters to like know that this mm. law is going to cost us a dollar. I mean it's hard to analyze and understand that it will cost us a dollar. We could never like coordinate around it. If I spend an hour of my time trying to stop this law, like that's earning a dollar an hour, it's not worth it. Whereas this one company, this concentrated interest or an industry that's going to benefit by 50 million, they're going to know about the law. They probably wrote the law. They're happy to spend 20 million dollars lobbying uh and they're still going to make 30 million dollars profit. So because um Sorry. because of this this information cost like we just we can't be informed about the details of 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 every law um and you know we can't tell whether our legislators are voting for this kind of law or whether they're voting for that law that like you know costs every american a dollar but like the 10% poorest americans it helps but like a thousand dollars right something like taxing to mm. pay for like early education um like we 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 can't tell uh and so that's the dynamics is just special interests kind of win again and again and again and it's not a surprise it's not cuz we didn't vote for the right people it's not because like we don't have enough activists getting out the word it's just actually the math of it and yeah. so we have now like 70 years of nobel prize winning economics it's about the math of how our current democratic systems produce crappy laws and so my dad comes along kind of in this next age and he says you know what we actually need is a fundamentally different political system And so he he is one of the originators um of a system called anarcho-capitalism which is a terrible name because basically everybody <laughs> either hates anarchism or capitalism <laughs> but really it's a system of of uh privately produced law and within the field of economic analysis of law which is a field that it kind of attempts to to figure out what laws are the best or the most beneficial um and it actually has kind of a model in a way of 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 determining this there's actually some some theoretical reasons to think that anarcho-capitalism might produce 
uh, efficient law, law that kind of benefits um, where like the total benefit to people is is the highest that if there's a, a legal change that on net benefits people that that it'll pass it now whether that would work in practice who knows but there's unlike our current democracies where there's theory that says no they're supposed to work poorly like that like that's that's the math of it here there's a theory that says like it actually ought to produce sorry uh, can you explain i didn't understand how what's what's the basic uh, principle of anarcho capitalism what is it really yeah. proposing so the idea is that um, each person registers with a private company called a protection agency that's going to determine what laws they live under and is going to have, you know, probably have like the police and the courts. And the laws that govern me and you interacting are negotiated between your protection agency and my protection agency. And I mean, it seems like in practice, there's going to be a ton of standardization and probably like most of it is going to be the same, you know, for anyone. And to understand why it would produce good law. So the way that economic analysis of law works is it has this standard for, for looking at the effects of a law, which is if we ask everybody affected by this legal change, how much would you pay to get this change or how much would we have to pay you? For you to be indifferent that's like your value in dollars of the impact of the law and if we add that up across everybody the law that affects and we say if that number is positive like if the total people in total would pay like 10 million dollars to have this change then that's a beneficial law and if it's negative if you'd have to pay them then mm -hmm. then it's a harmful change and the reason now here's like the there's this double-edged sword of using money so the downside of the fact that we're measuring this in dollars is that it is going to weight people who have more money more highly because they're going to they're willing to pay more would have to be paid more. And we just like, yes, that's a problem. That's not ideal. But here's what it gets us this incredible benefit. What's different about money from something like like utility or happiness is that money is fungible. We can exchange it between people. So mathematically if the total number here is positive if people on net would pay to get this legal change then there exists a set of side payments meaning like all the people who want it throw all that money into a pool and then you pay everybody who doesn't want it the mm -hmm. amount that that they would say and you have money left over right and so you can like you can like give even more money right if i'm like you'd have to pay me a hundred bucks to have this law like I would actually much rather you pay me like 150 bucks, right? Because then I'm like, oh yeah, definitely. I'm like, I'm happy that you made this change and I got 150 bucks. And then the people, if if somebody, if you want it and you're willing to pay a thousand bucks for it, you you know that's your break even, right? You're going to be happy if you only have to pay 500 bucks. And so as long as that total number is positive mathematically, everyone can be better off, right? So what right. you get by using money as, as as your unit of measure here is that you can actually get what's called a Pareto improvement, a change where everybody is happier. And in anarcho-capitalism, if you're if 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 I'm the company, the protection agency representing a hundred thousand people, and I'm negotiating with your protection agency, you know, and you're you're twenty five thousand people. If there's some legal change where on net the total amount that my customers and your customers would pay is positive, then we can like. You know, we can change how much we charge people. We can charge the people who want it more and the people who don't want it less. We can package it with other laws and we can basically find an arrangement such that we like pass this law and our customers are all better off. And we as the company pocket some portion of that. And mm -hmm. so it's not going to pass. It's not going to pass a law that's like only a little bit beneficial, right? Because there's not enough surplus to make it happen. But the laws that are like significantly worth more than what they cost, it's going to pass those. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. And that was like a five minute introduction to an entire economic field. I mean, if you're interested, you should read my dad's book. Um, my dad's book, Law's Order, which is an introduction to the economics of law. Um, and then his book, Machinery of Freedom, which is an introduction to our narco-capitalism. Super interesting. I mean, two thoughts on that one. It seems like then you can treat laws as uh, ideas with values. Similarly to say startups or other say scientific knowledge, where this knowledge creates. And they're in the open world. source though. 
The great thing about laws is that the way that we do legal systems is people are really mad about secret laws as they should be. And so laws are, are public. And so mm -hmm. it is more like scientific research. It's kind of like all law is open source uh, by nature. Anyway, just to finish this thread. So then, you know, my grandfather's like, we have to just understand what good policies are, design good policies and advocate for them. My dad comes along like, no, the entire, like the political system, democracy is not a system for passing good policies. It's actually the, kind of the opposite. So what if we design this new political system? And, you know, at this point, there's like millions of people around the world who want to try anarcho-capitalism. Like that's, that's their thing. Um, you know, even 20 years ago, there was tens of thousands of those people enough to like start a new community. And so then I come along the next generation and I'm like, okay, we need like fundamentally different political systems and we have ideas. There's my dad's, there's other ideas for fundamentally different political systems, but there's no way to put them into practice. These are like ideas for startups and you can't do a governance startup. And so my focus is like, oh, hey, the thing that's needed is to open a space in the world for people to be able to do startup countries, you know, or startup cities with some degree of autonomy. And, but I don't know that it's like a difference in, um, you know, in, in how we think so much as just a difference in like what seemed to be like the next problem. Right. I think in some sense, this is getting played out virtually in the whole crypto world. The DAOs are, I mean, as you were talking about, I was getting sort of, I was reminded of the DAOs where they have their own, uh, in a sense, company constitution that you can sort of buy, vote into. So are are these ideas inspired by anarcho-capitalism? And there definitely feels a lot of parallel between the crypto world and what uh, you were saying has been proposed. That, that's right. I mean, a part of what I'm trying to do is bring the like flexibility of kind of easy entry and easy switching and opt-in governance that we have automatically in the world of bits to the world of atoms, right? To change our real world legal systems. But online, you kind of get this automatically, right? I mean, you can create, um, you know, a community or, or an app or a crypto network, like with a very low barrier to entry just by writing some code and people can switch very easily. And so you have this kind of competitive environment just by the nature of things, right? Um, and so the industry already has these characteristics. And, and you know, this is part of why our, our technology in the world of bits evolves so, so much faster. Uh, and then my interest is like, well, that's wonderful, but the real world, the meat world still matters. It matters a lot. How can we get software-like innovation in the meat world? Yeah, I mean, you've picked a problem that's probably 10x, 100x harder, but uh, but someone, someone's got to do it. Um, that's why crypto is further along than I am, but that's okay. <laughs> it's worth yeah. doing. Yes, it's definitely worth doing. Another tangent I want to explore, and I'm not sure if you've thought about it or not, but still I wanted to take it a shot. Um, um, say, have you thought about what governance systems will make sense when we become interplanetary species? I mean, it's a wide, wide open area right now, but uh, with whole, I mean, in 50 or maybe 100 years, it seems like it's not just uh, one Earth. We'll probably have colony on Mars and maybe even other places. And this is totally like a random shot I thought of asking you, might not have thought about it, but would love to hear your sort of views if you have thought about it. Uh, it's the wild, wild west right now, but how do you think it will sort of probably play out? I mean, I, I actually think it's pretty straightforward in that it, it, what are the dynamics of being interplanetary? That it, there are the dynamics of like frontiers going to new empty places and of being linked by very slow communications and transportation links. And those are things that have played out in human history. What we see with a frontier um, is that groups of people, that's that's the main way in, in our current world that you have kind of startup countries is in a frontier, people go to a new place. They're starting with like this blank slate. They get to have their founding moment and kind of create the, the structure of something really different. And so I think we'll get uh, really significant innovation from that being a new frontier. And then if you look at the world, we've had really different communications and transportation technologies over time, right? Like in, in the distance past, there was there was no way to communicate uh, further than smoke signals and, and no way to move beyond riding an animal. Um, you know, and today we've got we've got light speed and we've got airspeed. Um, and when we go interplanetary, we'll, we'll be back, we'll be have hit like this fundamental physical limit 
where uh, the speed of communication between different solar systems is is really slow. The speed of transportation is is, is really slow, and so I think it'll be what we see in in that case is that it's impossible to have large empires, um, you know, or impossible or like very very difficult, especially at at the beginning. Um, that there's has to be a lot of local autonomy because you know it's not you if you if you're 50 light years away, right? If like getting an answer from the capital takes a hundred years, like you just have to decide shit. And like, maybe the capital can decide things that matter at like thousands years scales, right? The, I don't know the policy about how much like you leak electromagnetic radiation that like might let another alien species know that you exist. Like maybe that's set by the capital, um, you know, but anything that happens over over a smaller time scale in your communication it just it like has to get decided locally there's there, there's no other way right yeah uh yeah i was more curious about i mean the first say the next 50 years of course will not probably get multi-planetary but i'm not sure if there are any laws on who claims say a part of moon or part of mars uh my understanding it's probably um undecided as of now uh, people have tried to make legal regimes for the moon but you know really it's it's uh like whoever gets there right and 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 lives there is is going to have the is going to have the power right okay so um so i, I think we we'll sort of end end off our conversation but i wanted to uh get into one last thing which is jhana meditation uh i see you're an expert meditator and you in fact today or yesterday posted a guide on jhana on your twitter so do you want to talk about what uh, the style of meditation is and um, uh, how do you get into it and how does it differ from other styles? Because I've, I've heard this term a multiple number of times. I meditate myself, but I'm not sure if I'm doing this type of meditation. I've just heard it gets you into very blissful states, but would love to hear your perspective on it. Sure. So, um, so jhana meditation, these are uh, absorption states as a type of Samadhi. Samadhi is concentration. Um, and so Samadhi is meditation experiences like the classic following your breath, where your your object is, is something that you're following very closely as one continuous conscious experience. Um, it's different from insight meditation techniques where you might be trying to uh, break apart a sensation. So you're doing a body scan and, and, and the guided meditation is like now, like sense exactly what's happening in your foot and, and, and dig into it. Like the tingles, like, are they hot or cold? Like how that's really happening where you kind of like go in and break it up. That's, that's not Samadhi. Uh, and mindfulness where you're sort of like, uh, I want to watch like what my mind is doing. My focus is on building this metacognition, um, is, is also really not, not Samadhi. Um, and. The jhanas are are these uh, altered states of mind that one can get into with uh, really really long samadhi practice. Um, the the more extreme, what they call the hard jhanas, is something that people can take months of retreat to get into, where you're concentrating on something like the breath um, continuously for most of the most of the day at the beginning, and over time you're able to kind of be focusing no matter what you're doing. Uh, and then you go into these kind of more extreme altered states. And, uh, and then the light jhanas are essentially at, as you, as you do samadhi, um, as you concentrate on an object, uh, and kind of get better at it and get more into it, you'll often find that you get pleasant feelings. Um, this can, mm. it can take the form of like, tingles in some part of your body a warm feeling a feeling of like peace or happiness and you know as you get able to follow the object kind of really really closely these pleasant feelings can kind of grow and become more stable and in the the, the classic light jhana you switch the focus of your attention to the pleasant feeling and then um, you know, if you do it right and, and how is really complicated and you should look at my guide and look at those, those resources. Um, but you, you focus on this good feeling and, you know, what you put your attention on kind of grows in, in, in your mind, right? It's like more of your experience when you're focusing on it. And if you're focusing on a really pleasant feeling, 
and you're staying on it, not like not trying to change it, not trying to like make it happen or force it. Um, it kind of fills like more of your sensory experience and feels even better. And um, it's really enjoyable to be focused on a pleasant feeling. And so in a jhana, this kind of turns into a feedback loop where you feel good and you're focused on feeling good and you enjoy being focused on feeling good. And so you feel better. And, you know, the level that this feedback loop can escalate to, you know, kind of depends who you believe. Uh, there are people who have experiences that are like whole body orgasms. Um, for me, uh, I've been able to get to like a, what I would describe as being like, I don't know, maybe 20% of an MDMA body high, just feeling like really good, this like noticeable sense of like physical pleasure that, um, you know, it's it's milder than those extreme, but it lasts for hours. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's really nice. It's a really, it's a really great, great resource. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of the, like the enjoyable part, but there's also this, um, this idea from Daniel Ingram that like a jhana, it's really an attentional mode. The Buddha called them perception attainments. So even though, you know, we're, we're kind of focused on this pleasure thing, um, you, you're able to go into the state of really, really strong concentration on one thing because that concentrating on one thing is so enjoyable, but you're developing this ability in your mind to focus super, super, super intensely on one thing. And then there are higher genres where you develop the ability to focus super intensely, say, on your entire visual field. Um, and, you know, I'm only giving like a little yeah. part of the Zana world because there's a bunch of different... And I can imagine uh, it must it. be hard to describe also. How do you describe an experience? Uh, I mean, that, that must be hard, right? What you're feeling precisely to put into words. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, for me, I mean, an example of how why, like how Zana is more perceptual. For me, my initial Zana experiences didn't have any pleasure. It came from visually focusing on things very, very intensely, um, not doing any focusing on the body and going into a state where I was just kind of locked in on the center of the vision and things outside looked really weird and things inside were really sharp. And I could just feel that my mind had like snapped into this different mode, which was like a really kind of weird and, and neat feeling where I was just like locked in. And I had this rushing feeling throughout my body, but it wasn't particularly pleasant or unpleasant it was just kind of this weird like constant whooshing um and so there's a it's it's really there's a lot of different ways to experience it if you're interested in kind of the theory um daniel's book mastering the core teaching of the buddha is like the book um on, on on theory but in general i guess i like it because it kind of delivered like it's kind of epic you know, it's like, what, what do I want from meditation? Like, I don't just want to be like able to say like, oh, yeah, I meditate or like a little bit more peace. Like, I, I, I want to be able to change my state, right? And, yeah. and have kind of interesting experiences. And, you know, samadhi, samadhi leading into, into jhana is an approach that can really get you, um, you know, a, a, a resource that those good feelings help you to cope with life. And that being able to generate internally within yourself feeling good helps you release cravings and not look to the external world to 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 grab things. Um, you know, the Buddha and and then being that that very sharp mind that comes from being able to concentrate really intensely on one thing is then good for other types of meditative exploration. Um, so kind of the you know classic approaches to is for for combining jhana and other types is to develop the ability to go into jhana to go into jhana and then to use your your concentrated mind to do all of the other types of meditation right right great so petri this has been fantastic conversation uh is there anything else you want to add which you wanted sort of maybe me to ask but i didn't ask hmm Any idea you've well, been thinking about and probably have not written about, love to sort of, or it's also okay if, if you think we've got, covered enough ground about your idea. We did, I, the, these ideas of sovereign communities beyond just charter cities, this is the first time I've talked about it in a podcast. So we, we kind of covered the important things. It's something that we've just been developing recently. 
uh, you know, I just say, if you're a potential um, like founder or investor uh, or partner, there's a, a contact form on our website to fill out. And we're going to be doing these, these meetups, launching a podcast, uh, releasing uh, information on what kind of founders we're looking for, what kind of companies we're looking for, all kinds of stuff is coming. So follow us on, on Twitter mainly. Yeah. And, um, you know, I hope to meet some of you at our events in, our, in the future. Yeah, I will add uh, uh, all the links in the podcast description, including the Jana guide. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's been wonderful, Petri. You have amazing ideas and you are doing a very difficult but extremely important job at innovating how governance should happen in future. And I wish you all the best uh, in, in your sort of uh, initiative and definitely would be very interested to see what kind of projects you end up funding in future. Wonderful. Thank you so much great. for having me. Have a great me. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.